Corinthians chapter number 3, the part that I wanted to focus on is beginning in verse number 9 where the Bible reads, For we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry. Ye are God's building. And the title of my sermon tonight is this, Ye are God's building. Now let's keep on reading here. It says in the next verse, According to the grace of God which is given unto me, as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another built thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so is by fire. Know ye not, watch this, that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy, for the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. Now it's very clear when we read this passage that the building that's being built here is a spiritual building. We're not talking about a physical building where we have a bunch of uh, trucks out there bringing in cement to lay the foundation and we're going to build a big building. No, it's a spiritual building. Jesus Christ is the foundation and he says that building is people because he says to the people of the church of Corinth, Ye are God's building in verse number nine. And then at the end, he says, the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. Now, if you would go to Ephesians chapter number two. And the reason I point this out is because we live in a day where churches often place great emphasis on building great physical buildings, giant physical structures, beautiful structures. Is that really the main work that God has called us to do? Is that something that the New Testament emphasizes in any way, shape, or form? In all of the letters that the Apostle Paul is writing unto these various churches where he talks about the things that he's working on and the things that they're working on and the things that they need to improve, or he never one time brings up their great big building program or the great big fundraiser to raise money for the building. Yet in most churches today, this has become a great emphasis, raising huge amounts of money to buy expensive buildings. Now, I want to start out by saying this. My sermon tonight is not to criticize other churches who do things a little different than we do things, or just to say that anybody who builds a building is bad or something like that. You know, I don't want you to misunderstand the sermon and take things too far and just use this to insult or criticize other churches. Okay, now are there churches out there who are abusive? Of course, that just, you know, it's all about money, money, money and build big palaces. But the main purpose of the sermon tonight is just to explain to you the philosophy that we have here at Faithful Word Baptist Church and why our church will never build a building and just explain the philosophy and the scriptural reasons. And I'm not saying that anybody who does this a little different is wrong. Sure, it's ridiculous when it's all about the building, but I just want you to understand why I have this philosophy that I believe is scriptural and why I think it's smarter for our church to never build a building ever, okay? So look at Ephesians chapter two, verse 19. The Bible says, "'Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God and are built. He's saying you are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord in whom ye also are builded together for an habitation of God through the spirit. So the building in the New Testament is the church. The Bible says that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. So in the New Testament, it is the church that is the house of God. It's not a physical building, a tabernacle or a temple, but he says you collectively make up the temple of God. You're God's building, okay? That assembly of people that makes up the church, that's God's building. Now, tonight, and, and if you would just flip a few pages over to Ephesians 4, tonight we are sitting in a building, okay? 
And that is very scriptural for us to be sitting in a building and having church tonight because of the fact that even in the earliest church, they had a building. You see, they met in the upper room. And we think of the upper room as being just a small little room. But if you remember, there were 120 people meeting for church in the upper room. So if you have a, a room big enough for 120 people to meet there and have church, that's a pretty big, giant space that they were using. Then, of course, we know that the Lord kept adding to the church daily, such as should be saved. We know that thousands were added to that church. Obviously, they grew. Obviously, they're meeting somewhere. There's some location where they're getting together and assembling, whether that's in the upper room, which had room for at least 120 people, maybe many more, or whether that's another building, a tent, a tabernacle, whatever anyone constructs, obviously just due to weather and due to logistics, there are times when you need to meet in a building. Like for example, in August in Phoenix, Arizona, you wanna meet in a building. You, know, you don't wanna be outside in this weather, it's, it's way too hot. Or if we were in some extremely cold place, like if we were having a church in Alaska or something, then the winters would be extreme and you'd need to have heat. So don't get me wrong. People who are against meeting in a building, that's just silly, okay? Because in the Bible, they met in different buildings. They met in people's houses, but they also met in much bigger buildings to accommodate thousands of people. Not, not the issue here. What the issue here is when we get out of the emphasis of reaching people and building people and carrying out that commission and where the emphasis instead becomes about building a physical building and our success is measured by physical buildings. This comes from a worldly philosophy. Yeah. This is how the world looks. The world is constantly insulting Faithful Word Baptist Church for meeting in a strip mall, right? Meeting in an office space, <laughs> you know, and they're mocking that because that's how the world thinks. Because the Bible says that there are people in this world who suppose that gain is godliness. Yep. You know, they look at wealth and money and palaces and stained glass windows and gold and silver and precious stones. That's what impresses them. But the love of money is the root of all evil. And God doesn't see as man seeth. God is looking at the people. God looks at us and says, you're my building. You're God's building. You are his workmanship, the Bible says. Look at Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. And that word edifying means building. That's what it means. And who here speaks Spanish? And we know that to say a building in Spanish is what? Edificio, right? To build something is to edify. That's what an edifice is. It's a building. And so he says here that the work of the ministry done by pastors, teachers, evangelists, prophets is the edifying of the body of Christ till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive, but speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. It's about building ourselves. It's about building each other. It's about building people's lives. It's not about building a physical building in the New Testament. Now, in the Old Testament, there are a lot of stories about warfare. People are going to battle and fighting with the sword and spear and shield. We know that in the New Testament, the application for those things is a spiritual application. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. We know that God's not calling us to take up sword and spear and go fight a physical enemy. It's a spiritual battle. The weapons of our warfare, the Bible says, are not carnal. They're not fleshly. So all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, but we have to understand that many things in the Old Testament that had a physical application have a spiritual application in the New Testament. So in the Old Testament, the physical battle 
is a spiritual warfare today in the New Testament. And in the Old Testament, there are great stories about magnificent buildings being built, whether that's the tabernacle, or whether that's Solomon's temple, or whether it's the rebuilding of the temple in the days of Ezra and Nehemiah, or whether it's the building of the wall around the city of Jerusalem. And these stories are profitable unto us today, but let me tell you something, they have a spiritual application. It's not about picking up the trowel and the hammer and going out and physically building a building. It's about building the church, which is people, not a building. That's why he says, look, you're the temple of God. You're God's building. He's using illustrations from the Old Testament temple to illustrate the building, quote unquote, of God's people in the New Testament. It's spiritual. It's not literal in the New Testament. That's what the Bible is teaching. Now, there are a lot of reasons why I do not believe that uh, it is wise for our church to ever build or purchase a building. And, you know, you may or may not agree with these things, but, you know, I'm just going to lay out to you what my philosophy is, which I believe is derived from Scripture and just from the wisdom that I've acquired just living on this earth. And even though I'm young, I grew up and was born and raised an independent fundamental Baptist. I mean, from the time I was born, I have gone to Baptist churches. And I have seen the downfall of many soul-winning Baptist churches. And a lot of it had to do with buildings and money. Okay, the love of money is the root of all evil. And whenever we get off track where it's not about the souls, it's not about the people, where it becomes about the building, you know, there's a danger for us to go down a very wrong path. And it's my job as a pastor, I believe, to lead us away from danger and to lead us away from carnality. And again, this is not saying that my philosophy or the way that we do things at Faithful Word is the only right way to do it, okay? This is just for us as a church to understand. And, I, and you know, if other people, other pastors would hear this and, and take it to heart, great. And you know, the, the men in our church that want to pastor someday, I hope that they'll listen to this and think about this and understand this, but we're living in a day where when someone goes out to start a church, often they start looking for the building even before they even start, you know, knocking the first door with the gospel of Jesus Christ because that's what it's about. Now, part of that comes from the desire to impress other people because of the fact that, you know, you don't want to be in a strip mall. You don't want to be meeting in an office space and, you know, you want to impress people. You want to have a real church building, you know, the real freestanding steeple, you know, the whole shebang. And that's what people think, right? But let me explain to you some of the reasons why it is not efficient or expedient for us to have a church building at, at this time or at any time. I'm telling you, my goal with this church is to meet in a storefront until Jesus comes. Amen. We're going to rent space until Jesus. Now you say, oh, well, you don't have any vision. You don't. Oh, I have great vision. Oh, I want the church to grow, but I just don't have visions of great buildings. I have visions of great people. Amen. You see, it's not about staying small. I don't believe in staying small. There are some people who do, and they, oh, all big churches are bad. I don't believe that. You know, God willing, our church will continue to grow. We've grown every single year, and we will continue to grow with God's help and by His grace. And I pray and hope that our church will someday run thousands of people, and I believe that it will. You know, if, uh, you know, I, I don't know. Maybe it will. Maybe it won't. That's not really what gets me up in the morning of, yeah, we're going to reach a thousand people. You know, that's not really that important to me because I believe it's God's job to build the church. Yep. It's our job to preach, to win souls, to be faithful. And Jesus said, upon this rock, I'll build my church. I believe that our church will probably one day run over a thousand people. I don't see why it wouldn't, but maybe I'm wrong. Who knows? Who cares? You know, the bottom line is we have a great church. Amen. It's about quality, not quantity. We're winning people to Christ. But honestly, God said, surely blessing I will bless thee and multiplying I'll multiply thee. And if we're going out and knocking doors and winning people to Christ, the church should grow. The church should multiply and staying small is not God's will. I don't believe. I think that it's about growth, but it's not about growing at any cost. It's about staying right, having integrity, zero compromise, and let it grow in its own time naturally, not try to rush the growth by bringing in the rock band, trimming the message, and so forth. 
But we don't want, we, you got to be careful because there's these people out there who have this attitude of like, growth is bad, stay small. No, that's, that's not what the Bible teaches. In the book of Acts, they're growing dramatically. And we should strive to grow as well. But here are some reasons why building a building or buying a great church building is not part of that program in my mind or in my vision. And I hope that after this sermon, you'll agree with me. You know, we've already seen a lot of the scriptures de-emphasizing physical buildings and, and emphasizing the spiritual building. But let me just compare to you uh, buying a house personally with buying a church building, okay? Just to help you understand where I'm coming from here, okay? First of all, when you buy a house for your family, here are some benefits to buying a house for your family. Number one, you get a huge tax write-off when you buy a house. Because if you buy a house, you pay interest, right? Because you usually have to borrow the money. I mean, most people, because we live in a debt-based economy, a debt-based system. I mean, even if you pull the money out of your wallet and look at it, it says it's for paying debts right on the dollar bill. So we live in a debt-based system. There's not even enough money in circulation to pay off all the debt because of the fractional reserve lending and the scam of the Federal Reserve, et cetera, et cetera. Et cetera. So pretty much every single person, I'm not going to ask for a raise of hand, every, pretty much almost every single person who buys a house, they, they borrow money to buy a house. You know, you have, to, you have to get a mortgage. But the benefit to doing that is that you usually end up paying about the same amount per month as you'd pay for rent anyway but you get to write off all that interest. All the interest is a write-off. So all those hundreds and hundreds of dollars of interest, that's a tax benefit, okay? Not only that, but when you buy a house personally, usually you can get in with no money down or very little money down. You don't have to put up huge amounts of money to get into a house. Number three, when you own a house, you know, if somebody sues you or, you know, the IRS comes after you, usually they can't take away your house that you live in because they understand, okay, you have to have a dwelling place, you know, you have to live here. Not only that, but usually when you go to buy a house, if you have reasonably good credit, you don't need a bunch of co-signers, you just kind of sign for it yourself and you're in, right? You have decent credit, you have a job, make enough money, you sign for it yourself. And not only that, when you buy a house for yourself, you have a reasonable idea of how many people are going to live in that house in the long run, right? Now, I always say that you should never buy a house with the attitude of, oh, well, I'm going to move in two or three years, or I'm going to move in five years. No, you're not, because you don't know, because what if the housing value drops and then you can't sell it? You could be upside down. So whenever you buy a house, it's always wise to think about it in the sense that you might be stuck in that house for a very long time. So that's why when I bought my house here to start the church in, I didn't buy a big house, but I bought a house. It's a small, old house, but... When I bought it, I thought about the fact, you know, I might be in this house for the next 30 years. So I need to think about the fact that I'm going to have kids and everything. So I need to get it at least, you know, three bedroom, two bath or whatever. You know, you got to have at least some room to grow. And, and the thing about it is that even though, yeah, you're going to have a lot of kids, there's only so many kids you can have. And then eventually they start leaving. You know, at least that's what I'm hoping. You know, eventually, you know, they hit, you know, they get married, get out of here. All right. You know, and eventually you're going to reach critical mass where they start leaving at the same rate that they're being born. And then it kind of, you know, you reach a certain maximum. I'm saying there's not going to be 100 people living in my house. Right? It's not going to be 200 people. I mean, you know, okay, at the most, there's going to be 10 or 12 people. You know, if I end up having a bunch of kids in that time. That's possible. Now let's compare these points with buying a church building, okay? Well, when you buy a church building, there's no tax benefit because churches aren't paying taxes anyway. So, you know, you're not getting that right off. So there's no tax incentive to owning a church. Not only that, but a church building is very expensive. So we're not dealing with the, the relatively small amount of money of buying a personal home for yourself, you know, $150,000, $250,000. Back in 2012, before I had come to this realization that I'm preaching to you tonight about why we should never own a building and why we should never buy a church building, back in 2012, I contemplated moving our church into a, a, a building, owning a building. And the reason why this thought came to my mind is because I opened the mailbox one day and there was a check for $75,000 in the mail made out to our church. So I got the check and I was thinking like, man, is this real? I mean, that's a lot of money. So I took it down to the bank and they said, yep, the money's there. I'm like, well, deposit this thing. 
So we had, you know, 75 grand. So I thought to myself, oh, wow, maybe God's providing us money so that we could get into a church building. Because, you know, how often do you have these big chunks of money to, to be able to put down on a church building? So I looked into it. I did some research. And, you know, but right away, something didn't sit well with me right away with that. Because I'm thinking to myself, wait a minute. So somebody gives me $75,000 and I'm going to go out and spend like 10 times that much? You know, it's like, wait a minute. If somebody gives me $75,000 and I go out and spend $750,000 or more, it, something didn't seem right about that. It just seemed weird. Okay. So I, you know, I started looking into it, though, just to kind of see what was out there. And here are some of the things that I found. First of all, I found that for $750,000, you could not even begin to get a building that's big enough for our church. Not even close. A church building for $750,000 would be way too small for the size of our church even back in 2012 with no growth, let alone growing room. I mean, if you're getting a 30-year loan, you got to have growing room, right? Well, the type of building that would have been purchased for $750,000, even in 2012, which was like the bottom of the market, the commercial real estate market was pretty close to the bottom in 2012, wasn't even close. The building that we would have needed that would have had some growing room would have been about one and a half million dollars, $1.5 million, okay. And not only that, but it would have had growing room, but not necessarily 30 years of growing room because our church is growing at a pretty good rate. It's growing pretty fast. So it would have had maybe five, 10 years, maybe, if, probably not even that for, oh, but you sell it and get another one. Yeah, but you don't know what the market's gonna do. It's not always that easy to buy the next building. And you know what? I've known a lot of churches that got into trouble doing stuff like that. Like I, was, I, I can remember talking to a pastor who was bragging about his financial wheeling and dealing, how he'd sold this property, bought this one, sold this one, and he's wielding millions of dollars. And he said, you know, there are a lot of pastors who can out-preach me, but he said, no one can out-finance me. That's what this pastor told me. And you know what? Within two years, he's no longer pastoring because he messed up the finances, because he just knew he's going to sell this property and that's going to fix everything. And then the market dropped and nobody wanted to buy it. And he was sunk. And because of the financial problems, it led to all kinds of problems. Look, how many divorces are caused by financial problems? Okay, well, let me explain something to you. Spiritual church divorces take place over financial problems too. When the church is all financially jacked up, church splits happen. People get angry, there's fighting, there's bitterness. And so forth. So we're talking about a lot more money than just buying a house for your family. Think about this. You know, how big is your house? How many square feet is your house? You know, my house is like after I, you know, well, my house is like 1,500 square feet. Okay. But, you know, let's say you have a big house that's like 3,000 square feet, right? That'd be a, considered a pretty big house, right? If you have a 3,000 square foot house, it's huge. Okay. Well, the thing is, though, you're sitting in a building that's 3,600 square feet. And we also have office space that we rent around the corner to store stuff. So we actually have like 4,300, 4,400 square feet here. Okay, and then my friend, Pastor Jimenez in Sacramento, California, Verity Baptist, their building is like 4,400 square feet also, okay? And this is a church that runs 100 and some people over there, okay? So we're talking about bigger buildings, big parking lots. How many vehicles do you have? One, two? Okay, how many vehicles does a church parking lot need? Hundreds, okay? So we're talking about a building that would be at least a million and a half dollars and it wouldn't even still be necessarily what you need, okay? Then you talk to the banks and you know what they want? 20% down. There's no, no money down. It's not buying a personal home. No, they want 20% down and it's not negotiable. And they say that's low. We really want 40% down, but they say the least we'll do is 20%, and then they'll give you a bad deal because you're only putting 20% down. Everything with business is more expensive than personal. Like, for example, you want to bring uh, internet into your home versus bringing it into the office, it's going to cost two or three times as much to bring it into the office. You want water bottles delivered to your home, twice as much to have water bottles delivered to a business. That's just the way things work. Business to business costs more than business to personal. 
So we're talking about having to raise money for 300,000 bucks. And I'm just giving an example here. It probably costs more than this to get the building we need. But raise money for 300,000 bucks where I get up and preach all these sermons about how you can't outgive God and put your hand on the screen and you need to mortgage your house and borrow. So then you have everybody digging deep, putting all their money in the plate, right? Mortgaging their home. To put, I'm, I've been in churches where people are told you need to mortgage your house yeah. and, or the church will sell bonds to people, you know, to raise money and borrow money from the church members and everything. And they get into everybody for all this money. Then not only that, guess what? Pastor Anderson's signature is not going to be enough. Oh, no. They want a whole bunch of people to sign, whole bunch of people to co-sign that loan. And now they're on the, and guess, guess which kind of people they want to co-sign. People who have money, people who have stuff, not just, oh, I'll do it, you know, I'm an 18-year-old guy living in an apartment, you know, yeah, I'll co-sign Pastor Anderson, I got your back. No, no, they want people who have something to lose, who have good credit, who have money, who own things as collateral. So basically, you're getting into debt, first of all, and, and let me say this, our church has existed for the last 10 years, and we've never borrowed any money in 10 years. And we've always been able to pay every bill on time. You know, I think that's a pretty good financial record to pastor a church of a couple hundred people and to never borrow any money and to pay every bill on time and to always have money and to never run out of money, okay? That's the best way to do it. And that's why our church will just continue to operate in cash. Because you know what? If we don't have the money for it, then we don't need it. I think that's a great philosophy to operate our church under. Amen. Why not? Why not rent a building until Jesus comes? There's no point in owning. There's no benefit. Plus, we have no idea how big the church is going to get. So we might shell out that 1.5 mil. We might raise that $300,000, have the thermometer, spin the wheel, you know, raise the money, have the bake sale, and do it. We might raise all the money. Everybody gets all strapped for cash and pours every last cent into that down payment. Then you still have to pay the payments every month on the thing. Okay, what's a mortgage on $1.5 million to a church like Faithful Word? You know, this is a volatile institution, folks, in, in the world's mind, right? right? Yeah. They're not going to look at this as like, oh, yeah, this is a... Because why? Because we're independent. We don't have the Presbyterian denomination or the United Methodist denomination. I mean, the bank's like, well, who's, who's your denomination? Who's your district leader? You know, you're not in the Southern Baptist Convention? You're not in the North American Baptist Association? No, they don't, you're independent? What? What, you have no credit? What, you know? Okay, well, let's get all these people with money in your church. And here's the thing about people with a lot of money. You know what, thank God there are some people who have a lot of money that are spiritual people, but let's face it, the majority of spiritual people are not wealthy. Now look, don't get me wrong, the exception proves the rule. There are people who have a lot of money that are spiritual giants. I believe that. There are people like that in the Bible. People like Philemon seem to have had money. But here's the thing though. You know and I know that God has chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith, and heirs of the kingdoms which he hath promised to them that love him. But you've despised the poor. Do not rich men oppress you and draw you before the judgment seats? Do not they blaspheme that worthy name by the which you're called? You know, just to quote a little scripture, but there's more than that. Okay, so do we really want our destiny to be controlled by a bunch of money-bagged people who are controlling the credit and they've got their name signed and we better do it the way that they want because they don't want to lose that investment and blah, blah, blah. You know, now you've got all these financial ties. You're financially married to all these church members. See, when I get up and preach some face-ripping sermon that old Mr. Moneybags doesn't like, he can just kind of slink out of here and not let the door hit him on his way out when he doesn't like the sermon that tells how Bruce Jenner really is or whatever. You know, it's like, hey, don't let the door... And he'll just go huff and puff and blow the house down and go somewhere else. But not when he's got all his bonds and he's all co-signed and put money into... You know, he's going to feel invested and want to stay and screw things up. 
This is reality, friend. This, I've seen, I'm not just speaking in theory. I'm not just laying at home paranoid, like, what would people do? This is stuff that has really happened. I've seen it. I've been in churches that were big, growing, thriving, soul-winning churches. Oh, we're going to build this great building for the glory of God. And then, you know what ended up happening? It all went downhill. And a lot of it had to do with the buildings. Now, there's a lot of reasons for that. So I'm, I'm just kind of showing you why it doesn't even make sense financially. Now you say, okay, Pastor Anderson, well, what if God just works some great miracle where, you know, somebody just gives you millions of dollars and then you can go buy a building with it? Or, you know, what if there's just some killer deal where some church building's on the market way below market value and you can just steal it away? It's still going to cost a fortune, even a good deal, even at half price, even at a quarter price, it's still going to cost way too much. It would still cost a huge amount of money, money that we don't have. But let's just say that, you know, the heavens open up and a church building just falls out of the sky. You know, even then, I'm, and listen, you don't believe me, but honestly, I can say right now from the bottom of my heart, I don't want it. Take it back where it came from. <laughs> Beam it right back up. If it can come, right, you know, take it back up in the sky where it came from and I never want to see it again. Why? And let me tell you why. Let me explain to you why. Because the fact is, that where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Go to, go to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. The Bible says in Matthew 6, verse 19, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Now listen very carefully to this. When you've got nothing, you've got nothing to lose. No thieves break through and steal nothing. <laughs> Rust does not corrupt nothingness. There's, if there's nothing, then you have nothing to lose. And true freedom comes from possessing nothing. Okay, in many ways. I mean, you're free now. Because nobody can take anything away from you anymore. You know, the great uh, author of the 20th century, Alexander Solzhenitsyn, who wrote the Gulag Archipelago, and he wrote this book exposing how evil the Soviet Union was and the concentration camp. He spent 11 years in the Gulag system. He went through some of the torture, and he went through the deprivations of working in a forced labor camp and where everything is taken from you. And his, he had a really good quote. He said, People only have power over you as long as they leave you with something. But he said, once they take everything away from you, you're free again. Because he said, you know, when you don't have anything, then people can't really control you. They can't really intimidate you. They can't threaten you because you have nothing to lose. Right. And that's basically what the Bible is saying here. Look, put your treasure somewhere where you've got nothing to lose on this earth. Thieves can't break through or steal. Moth and rust can't corrupt it because it isn't there because you don't have treasures laid up on the earth. Now, here's the thing. Where our treasure is, there will our heart be also. Where do we want our heart to be? In the people? In the souls? Or do we want it to be in buildings and facilities and fancy structures? I mean, think about that. Now, let me say this. I am not a person who's into money. I'm, I'm not a person who has spent his life seeking money or I just really desire to lay up money and treasures and, and have all these things. But let me tell you something, though. I am a human being. And here's the thing. The Bible says, Let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. And even though that is not something that I could ever see myself being tempted by, you know, laying up a bunch of wealth and doing But here's the thing, though. There are a lot of people in the Bible and also just a lot of people who we could see in our lives who basically get their hands on a whole bunch of money and it corrupts them. They get their hands on a whole bunch of money and they go crazy. And they start making weird decisions, doing weird things. It changes them. Look at all the people who win the lottery and, and it ruins their life and they do a bunch of stupid things. Look, it's reality. So... You know, and I remember my dad would always tell me about his dad. His dad had a whole bunch of money, but he wasn't saved. And his mother prayed that if it would take him losing all the money for him to get saved, then, then that that would happen. And he did. He lost all of the money. 
and he got saved, and he, he just never really made it financially after that. You know, he always had enough to live, and, and he did well, but he never had that wealth that he had in the early days ever again. And my dad always said that God just knew probably that he couldn't handle it. So he just kind of kept him lean to a certain point. And then my dad always told me, he said, you know, God's never really allowed me to ever just really turn that corner financially. You know, maybe God just knows I couldn't handle it. And you know what? Honestly, that, those are wise words when we stop and think, you know what? Maybe it wouldn't be good to have millions of dollars at my disposal because maybe I just wouldn't know how to handle it. Or maybe I would just, you know, get a crazy thought or a covetous thought or start making stupid decisions or start, how about this? Getting prideful. Like Nebuchadnezzar, where he looks out the window at all the buildings. And what does he say? Oh, it's not this great Babylon that I've built. Nobody can outfinance me. You know, like that pastor told me a few years ago. It can go to people's head. Yeah. Or not only that, let's say, okay, let's say the pastor's incorruptible. You know, God willing, he is. Let's say the pastor's totally incorruptible. But what about this? What about the fact that it's just a big target? When there's all this money, whether it's money in the bank or money tied up in a giant building, you know, what about just the target of somebody who wants to get in there and get control of that money and get control of those, those properties and so forth? Now, sometimes that person's name is the IRS. And here's the thing with the IRS. I mean, there's so many complicated rules that even if you do everything by the book, they'll still come in and mess with you and, and try to figure out where you didn't cross the T or dot the I. And they'll come in sometimes and just targetedly harass certain people that don't fit in with their agenda of our United States government. And so the IRS can come in and give you fits and come in and, and move in with you. They'll literally do these type of audits where they move in with you, where they basically every day they're here watching you, following you, where they move in and do everything with you and see how you do everything and look at everything you do and analyze it. And you say, well, if you're not doing anything wrong, you have nothing to hide. But you, say, you don't really want them moving in with you. And sometimes they just make stuff up that's not even legit. Right. And just say, I'm God. This is the rule. We don't care what the law says. This is what we're going to do. And then comes the dreaded padlock on the front door. Right? They padlock. They literally padlock the facility. I've seen it. He's seen it. And he's an accountant. So they'll padlock the facility. Well, here's the thing. Go ahead and padlock our rented facility. <laughs> oh, you want to seize all our assets? There's not much. Here's, our here's the keys to the church van. <laughs> Enjoy, buddy. Because you know what? When you got nothing, you got nothing to lose. Somebody wants to come in here and shut us down or sue us they're going to sue the pants off of us. Well, you know what? I'll go buy another pair of pants, you know, <laughs> at the thrift store. Because honestly, my pants aren't that expensive, buddy. You know, oh, man, we're going to sue you. Uh, listen, I've been accused. I, I, I've been, I'm sorry, not accused. I've been threatened with lawsuits so many times I can't even count. But it's funny that our church has never been sued. You want to know why? Because any lawyer is going to look at the pie and realize there's no pie. <laughs> So how can I get a piece of it when there isn't one? Okay? And then, well, but we'll come after you personally, Pastor Anderson. I don't own anything. I don't have any money. I have eight kids. <laughs> come sue me. For what? Nothing. I don't own anything. Well, we'll sue Faithful Word. Faithful Word doesn't own anything. What now? Huh? <laughs> See what I'm saying? So you don't have this target on you of people wanting to sue you or audit you or steal from you or, or infiltrate the church, take over and get control of the assets and split the church and this, you know, all this stuff. It just, it all just becomes a non-issue, okay? Because of the fact that there's no money to fight over. It just isn't there, okay? But that's if everything goes well and you own a bunch of buildings and have a bunch of money in the bank. How about the flip side of that where it all goes downhill and the church gets into debt up to their eyeballs? Because I can tell you about all the churches where the finances went great and where all the buildings are paid off and they're sitting on millions of dollars and then the pastor is corrupted. And then there's a church split. There's fighting. Everybody wants a piece of the pie. The trustees are mad and the cosigners are mad and the lender, you know. 
Okay, I can tell you that side, but then there's the other side of the coin where the churches just get in over their head, up to their eyeballs in debt. You know, God forbid, what if the church got smaller and you're into some giant building with a huge debt? I've been there, done that, I've seen that. Okay, or what about the churches that are just up to their eyeballs in debt, can't pay the bills, then all the fighting and bickering. Look, you, you, you alleviate all this by just renting a building. Here's why renting a building makes sense. Because when you rent a building, you can get it for the size church you are right now. Not the size you used to be, not the size you're going to be, but the size you are right now. Why? Because there's no long-term commitment. In a year or two, the church is bigger. You walk away. You get into it. Hey, God forbid the church gets smaller. So what? Get a smaller building. No sweat. Doesn't matter. Whereas with the building, you're locked into a certain size where it's either too big or too small. Renting gives you the flexibility to just move on whenever it's time to move on. And there's no putting people at financial risk. There's no fundraisers. There's no thermometers. There's no sitting there and getting people to mortgage their houses and getting Mr. Moneybags to co-sign the, the, the lease and everything. You know, it's just so much simpler and easier. You just pay as you go. You're flexible. And when stuff breaks, the landlord fixes it. You don't have to fix it. Whereas when you buy the building and you scrape together that last penny and then stuff starts breaking. I mean, remember when you bought your first house for your family? Oh, this is great. We own. And then something breaks like the next month and then you have to fix it. You're used to just calling the landlord. Hey, the air conditioner is not working. Now it's like, hey, you need a new air conditioner. It's $5,000. Like, Oh, man. So there are a lot of benefits to just renting. Okay, and that's the way we're going to do it. And you say, well, Pastor Harrison, you're limiting our church. You're limiting the growth. No, we're not, because there's always a bigger building to rent. Think about the buildings you could rent. You could, if the building, if the church got huge, where you're running thousands, you could rent like a grocery store. <laughs> Seriously, like the building. Think of, I've worked in construction and I've worked in retail in the fire alarm business. And I've done all kinds of maintenance and inspections on vacant properties all the time. And buildings where there used to be a Kmart or a Mervyn's, Bed Bath & Beyond, linens and things, grocery stores, Walmart for crying out loud. Huge, gigantic buildings that are just empty. Just a big, empty rectangle. I mean, what do we need if it's not just a big, empty rectangle? I mean, isn't that good enough? And then you can come in and you can make it nice and you can do, I mean, look at our space right here. I mean, look at all this artwork. It's like an art gallery in here for crying out loud. You know, I mean, you can make it nice, but you just keep getting a bigger storefront. You keep getting a bigger office space and you just stay in the office space until doomsday. Amen. And when the sun and moon are darkened and the stars begin to fall, faithful word is still in a strip mall. <laughs> Running thousands, albeit, but in a strip mall. Why not? Why not? It just makes sense, people. And then you don't get corrupted. You don't get tempted. And again, I'm not saying, hey, it's bad to buy a building for other people. It's bad. I'm just telling you that as long as I'm running things here, we're not buying a building. We're not having a building fund. We're not raising a bunch of money. But I'll take it a step further than that. We're not even going to fill a giant bank account full of money ever. The money that comes in every month, we spend it. We spend all of it. <laughs> why? You say, well, why spend it all? Because why sit on it? Now go, if you would, to Matthew chapter 25. You were there in Matthew uh, 6. I'll finish reading in Matthew 6 while you're turning. He said, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. The light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. But if thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness? The eye referring to looking at and lusting after possessions, the love of money, covetousness. And then he says, no man can serve two masters for either he will hate the one and love the other or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Mammon being money, the God of money. But look at Matthew 25, the Bible reads in verse 13, Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. For the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods. And unto one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one. To every man according to his several ability, and straightway took his journey. 
Then he that had received the five talents went and traded with the same and made them other five talents. And likewise, he that had received two, he also gained other two. Matthew 25, verse 18. But he that had received one went and digged in the earth and hid his Lord's money. After a long time, the Lord of those servants cometh and reckoned with them. And so he that had received five talents came and brought other five talents, saying, Lord, thou deliverest unto me five talents. Behold, I've gained beside them five talents more. His Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. He also that had received two talents came and said, Lord, thou deliverest unto me two talents. Behold, I've gained two other talents beside them. His Lord said unto him, Well done, good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Then he which had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew thee that thou art a hard man, reaping where thou hast not sown, and gathering where thou hast not strawed. And I was afraid, and went and hid my talent in the earth. Lo, there thou hast that is thine. His Lord answered and said unto him, Thou wicked and slothful servant! Thou knewest that I reap where I sowed not, and gather where I have not strawed? Thou oughtest therefore to have put my money to the exchangers, and then at my coming I should have received my own with usury. Look, he's saying, don't bury what God gives you in the earth, Use it. Put it out there. Let it grow. Let it multiply. If God gives you five talents, he wants to receive ten when he gets back. If he gives you two, he wants four. He doesn't want to give you one and get one. And he doesn't want you to fearfully go bury it in the earth. He wants you to do something with it. And look, when it comes to the money that is given to Faithful Word Baptist Church, when it comes to not only the tithes and offerings, but there are a lot of people who send us money from all over the world and from all over the country. Literally, probably half, not probably, half the money that comes into this church comes from outside of this room, at least, if not much more than that. I mean, I haven't looked at it lately, but in the past, it's more that people send here than what is actually given in the plate, okay? Why? Because our church has internet presence of thousands and thousands of sermons, YouTube videos, audio recordings, all kinds of stuff that's all over the internet that gets millions and millions of listens every year. I mean, our church has just tens of thousands of sermons being downloaded from the website every month and from YouTube. I mean, it's off the charts, people. I mean, the numbers are mind-boggling. How many people listen in? Why? Because they're hungry for this kind of preaching. You know, they're, they, it's not because I'm a great preacher. It's because I'm the only game in town that's actually saying this stuff. Amen. Because there are so many preachers who've compromised that it's hard to even find sound biblical preaching that's going to rip some face. And that's what people want to hear. And so that's why millions of sermons are downloaded constantly. Okay? Well, that caused a lot of people donate. You know, and they send money, send money. So, you know, our church has plenty of money. Even before that, our church had enough money because the philosophy is we don't spend what we don't have. Okay? If we have it, we spend it. If we don't have it, we don't spend it. So there are certain things that obviously have to be paid every month. Okay? Whether or not we want to. Because obviously the rent, we got to pay the rent. Obviously my salary gets paid because I have to live and feed my eight children. Okay? Uh, then also, obviously, you know, our ad in the yellow pages or the internet bill, you know, for live streaming the service. I mean, there's certain things that are bills that come every month. Certain expenses, you know, putting some gas in the church van for the soul winning and whatever. But there's a lot of other money that we spend above that on things that are optional that we don't really have to do, but we do them because we have the money. So, for example, notice how we give out tens of thousands of audio preaching CDs. They're all free. Tens of thousands of DVDs. We have all the movies back there on the shelf. All free. No, we never sell anything. When have you ever gone to a church that gave you so much free stuff? Never. They charge you money for everything at most churches. I've been to churches where they charge you money for the tracks that you use out soul winning. You buy them and then go out and, and go soul winning with them. Seriously. You, go, you show up at soul winning and you buy packs of these for a buck each. Literally. 
you know, if there's any kind of a dinner, any kind of a lunch, any kind, it's, hey, it's $10, $5. If there's a youth activity, it's $10, it's $5. If there's a banquet, it's $30. If it's, you know, we just do everything for free. We have activities. We give you the preaching CD. You know, people would always try to buy the preaching CDs for me, and I always tell them, I'll pay you to listen to them. <laughs> buy the, you know, why would I sell it to you? I want you to hear it. You know, we want as many people to hear this stuff as possible. It's the word of God. So basically, it makes more sense to me if God gives us money. Because honestly, I believe that God is the source of all blessing. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. If money comes in, it's money that God has provided and it's actually the Lord's money. It actually belongs to God. It belongs to the church, but the church is the house of God. And so it's really the Lord's money. So that money is spent on the Lord's work, doing God's work, okay? Well, what does God want us to do with his money? I mean, does he really want us to go bury it? I mean, what does it say in the Bible? Does he really want us to go just fill up some giant bank account for a rainy day. We live in the desert, okay? But here's the thing, you know, oh man, we got to save it up for a rainy day. But here's the thing, you know what says, let's save it up for a rainy day? Fear. Fear. Oh, what if somehow, what if we need that? Shut up with the what if, just spend it. Because use it for God's work. People are dying going to hell every day. Let's go full speed ahead. Let's work as hard as we can. Now, look, you, you know, what type of things do we spend money on? You know, part of it is, part of it gets reinvested into the internet thing because, first of all, that's where half the money's coming from or more than half the money. So, yeah, a lot of it gets reinvested back into that machine because of the fact that if people all over the world are being blessed by the sermons and they're putting money in as a token of their appreciation, you know, it's good to take that money and put it toward giving back to them that they can be blessed by the money that they put into this ministry. And that's why we spent all the money to upgrade the thing where now we have crystal clear sound and the videos are live streamed and we have, you know, high quality video and everything like that. Why? Because we want to reach more people with the gospel, with the truth, with the word of God. And then those people are some of the people who have even funded this ministry in many ways. Not only that, but, you know, getting, getting the movies translated into other languages and, and getting the subtitles put on and, and getting them transcribed and getting it out in the search engines where people are finding the sermons to the tune of thousands per day are finding out about our church, finding out about this preaching. You know what? That's great because that's just people that are hearing the word of God and God's work goes forward. That's a lot better than having $100,000 sitting in the bank Okay, hundred thousand bucks sitting in the bank, so that if we can get to three hundred thousand, when that red in the thermometer hits the top, we can then go out and spend five times that much. We can just struggle and strive to raise three hundred thousand, so that we can spend one point five million, so that we can finally stop having gaytheists and fagnostics tell us that we're meeting in a strip mall. Who cares? They hate us anyway. Nuts to them. And you know what I found out? We, by the way, our church started in a house, okay? Who was here when we were meeting in the house? Only a few people, um, everybody's in this side of the building. Okay, people that were there, we were meeting in the house. Okay, but here's what I noticed. When we moved into our first building, all the same people who didn't like it in the house didn't like it in the building because it turned out it wasn't the house that was the problem. It was the preaching that was the problem in their mind. Because I remember when we first moved into our first building, I had a visitor card back when we did visitor cards, but I had a visitor card from every visitor who'd ever visited our church while we were in the house, and I wrote them all a letter talking about how we're in this building now. We're, we're in a real building now. So, and I sent out this letter to all of them, and we had like three different households show up. It was like a family, a couple, a single, whatever. It was three different entities show up, okay, that had come in the past, but now they're coming back now that we're in a building. And they all came that one time and never came back. So it turned out it wasn't, it, it, they're like, no, we still don't like this preaching even now that it's in a building. <laughs> you know, I do not like it in a house. I do not like it in the building. I don't want it with a fox. I don't want it in a box, you know. If you don't like it, you don't like it, you know. Because guess what? The people who want this kind of preaching, 
They don't care whether they're sitting in a living room or a tent or a church building or an office space or a strip mall. They're hungry for the word of God. That's what they care about. They don't care about chandeliers and who, you know, that's not what it's about to them. And so they don't care. So who cares about them? You know, don't sit there and try to reach people that don't even care because the people you're trying to reach with fancy buildings don't want the word of God. And the people who do want the word of God, they don't care if we're meeting in a mud hut, they'll be there. <laughs> I remember the first time that I went to a real fired up soul winning, because I grew up independent fundamental Baptist, but you know, when I got in a real red hot soul winning, you know, independent fundamental Baptist church, uh, as a teenager, I remember when I showed up, their air conditioner was broken. And it was the height of summer, and it was like 110 degrees outside or whatever. And Sacramento, California has a few weeks like that every year where it's really just as hot as it is here. A few, just a few weeks, though. We have it for half the year. But they have, you know, for a few weeks. And I remember we're sitting there, and, and the church didn't even have padded chairs like we have. Metal folding chairs. And on the back, they had stenciled on the back, Nuestra Casa. Because they got them from some, you know, Spanish restaurant or something. So it's just all these metal folding chairs stenciled on the back, Nuestra Casa, okay? Big giant fans that just did nothing but blow hot air around that was already there. No air conditioning. And I remember sitting in there as a 17-year-old boy. I'd spent the last five years in just watered down, dead Baptist churches. And I remember sitting in that church with it just hot, all the doors and windows are open, it's 110 degrees outside, I'm sitting in a metal folding chair, and the pastor's up there yelling about soul winning, and I remember thinking, I love this place, it's great, I love it! Where has this church been all my life? <laughs> Why? Because who cares about all that other stuff? It's about the word, it's about souls being saved. So look, if I can, if I can sit there and take the money and spend it on getting preaching CDs into the hands of thousands of people, getting these videos in the hands of thousands of people, getting thousands and thousands of people to find our church website every single day, then why would I sit there and just pile it up somewhere so I can count it like King Croesus or something and sit there like, you know, that uh, Donald Duck or whatever, Scrooge McQuack or whatever, swimming around in his money. <laughs> Who cares? You know, I'd rather spend every last dime. Put it all out there. Get it all out. Spend it all. You know what? Because then nobody's going to be tempted to steal it. Nobody's going to come audit it. You know, it's all going to the Lord's work. It's all legit. But it's all gone. <laughs> and when, the, you know, when somebody wants to sue us and padlock the front door of our church, you know what we'll do? We'll shut this church down and start another one across the street. <laughs> right? Yep. All in favor, say aye. aye. Who cares? Oh, yeah, come sue us. Come shut us down. Come padlock the front door. All right. Hey, Mr. IRS man, here's the keys to the building and the keys to the van. <laughs> See you later. And if, you know, I'll give you my forwarding address over at Living Word Baptist, <laughs> you know, across the street. <laughs> what are you going to do about it? Because if you got nothing, you got nothing to lose. But you know what? When you got the big multi-million dollar building and all the debt, then you got to be careful what you preach too. So you don't want to run off your trustees and your co-signers. Mr. I mean, you could screw up your loan or whatever. You know, you don't want to mess with Mr. Moneybags. You don't want to confuse him. Now go, I have one last point I wanted to make tonight. Go to 2 Timothy chapter number 2. I'm out of time, but I just want to make one last point. I mean, is this making sense tonight? I think it makes great sense. You know, I, I think that just w when the church becomes money oriented and it's about buildings and this fund and that fund and saving up a bunch of money, you know, I'd rather, look, I just want to figure out ways to spend the money to reach the most souls. You know, and if there's enough extra money, then I'll hire an assistant. Right? And then we can do work for the Lord. We can go out and talk to people and win them to Christ and reach people and preach sermons and get people saved and go soul winning and do something with our lives instead of just financing buildings and sit back and say, oh, look at all these buildings. You know what no one can ever take away from us as a church? No one can ever take away from us the souls that we've won to the Lord. Amen. They'll be there in heaven and nothing can change that. They'll be there. Amen. They, we're not going to be gone. 
Now, here's the thing. I remember my dad was an electrician. And my dad put a lot of hard electrical work volunteering on these building programs because a lot of times they'd use labor from the church. And he would slave away on some building only for the church to go liberal. And look, I could tell you about multiple churches, the same story, where basically the church is fundamental, the church is big, the church is thriving. And look, I'm going to tell you this, and it sounds unbelievable. It might even sound hard to believe, but I can literally tell you multiple scenarios that happen like this in my life, churches that I went to as a kid. Church is big, thriving, soul winning, King James, rah, 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 preaching good. And then they get the big buildings and then they build the big church building. And then that's not enough. They have to build a big gymnasium, yeah. you know, for the Christian school and for the banquets and whatever. So they build the big church building. They build the big Sunday school facility. They build the big gymnasium and they're on millions of dollars of property. Then they start, you know, changing the doctrine, going liberal, praising Billy Graham and whatever and just, you know, getting all weirded out and bringing in other versions, whatever. And then they start running people off and alienating people. And people start quitting the church, quitting the church, quitting the church. Okay? And I've literally known of two churches where they literally just ran everybody off. Basically, people would call the pastor on the carpet for some of the stuff he's doing, where he's going liberal, where, or, or how about this, hiring his kids on the payroll, and paying them too much money, you know, paying them more than everybody else getting paid, doing the same jobs, okay? He puts his kids on the payroll and yada, yada, yada. And then pretty soon they've run off everybody to where the church keeps getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And then the church is too small for the big building. And then you know what they did? They sell the big giant building for millions of dollars. And then you know what they do? They put that in a bank account and then they go rent a building in a strip mall like we're doing. And they have millions of dollars in the bank. And then they just live off that for the rest of their lives. I can tell you two churches that I went to as a kid where that's what happened. The church ended up going liberal, shrinking down to nothing, selling the facilities to some apostate church, and then putting millions of dollars into a bank account. And then they just operate a tiny church out of a strip mall, no desire to grow, no desire to win souls meet up with their tiny little group in the strip mall and they know that their salary is set for the rest of their life because they got millions of dollars sitting in the bank to pay their salary for the rest of their life. Two scenarios like that that I literally witnessed. But here's the thing. Then the people who've sat there and slaved on the building and, and took out the mortgage and borrowed money and put into the building fund and ran all the electrical for free and they're off time on the evenings and the weekends, they're like, oh man, what a waste of my time. I mean, my dad has literally said to me so many times, you know, I ran all those electrical wires and now it's some heathen church. It's some church that doesn't even believe the Bible. They're not even Baptist. Some phony church is in there using the building. I remember one time I clicked on the cable access TV as a kid and I saw my old church building, the, the church that I grew up in, and basically it had become a charismatic church. So you know, the, remember cable access TV? So I'm at home and I'm flipping through the channels as a teenager and I see the church I grew up in and there's this charismatic preacher and somebody's playing the organ while he preached. And he's like, Z -Z, you know, <laughs> woo! You know, well, I come to tell you this morning, yeah, do, do. Woo you know, and it was just this wild circus. And I'm thinking to myself, that is so weird. I mean, it'd be like if you saw like this, you know, this background and there's just some charismatic service going on. So, you know, how do you think my dad felt? And, and, and not just my dad. I mean, there's other people who volunteered and worked. But here's the cool thing about our church. All the work that you put in, all the money that's put in the plate, you know what, it, it goes right out to something that you can see right then and there. It just translates right away into millions of people hearing the word of God. It translates into hundreds of thousands of doors being knocked. It translates into the work of the Lord right here, right now. Not some building of, hey, isn't this building great? We're going to grow old in this thing for the next 30 years. Psych! <laughs> Two years later, you know, I'm screwing the whole thing up. That's reality, my friend. And by the way, I'm not hiring my kids to work for this church either. Let me say that right now. Because you know what? And listen, kids, if you think I'm going to hire you, you're wrong. Solomon, Isaac, John, the, you know what I want my kids to do? I want my kids to go out and get a job somewhere else so that their boss can yell and cuss at them 
so that they can figure out what it's like in the real world, not where everything's being handed to them all the time. Not some dynasty where they grow up little Lord Fauntleroy and basically they're just handed the keys to the kingdom when they're 18 years old and they have their own office and their own company vehicle and they're working for dad and it's the family dynasty. Wrong. You go out and make it in the ugly world yourself and figure out what it's like for everybody else who has to pull themselves up by their own bootstraps. But that's another story. But anyway, uh, the last thing I want to point out tonight is in uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2. Because I want to tell you something. When it comes to growing the church, like I said, I believe in church growth. I think church growth is great. I want the church to grow. That's not the most important thing, though. But look what the Bible says in verse 1. Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Let me tell you something. More important than growing in the sense of just our congregation here getting bigger, the better growth would be that we can send out other men to go start churches somewhere else. Somewhere else than to just see how big we can build this crowd. We want this crowd to be big. I think it'll be over a thousand someday, God willing. But you know what? I'd rather send as many men out of here as I can that are trained, faithful men who shall be able to teach others also to start and pastor churches elsewhere in this nation. Because then all the eggs aren't in one basket. Then if faithful word goes down, there could still be other great churches all across America still holding forth the word of life and still serving God. So what's the vision for our church? You say, Pastor Anderson, you know, where do you see yourself in five years? You know, like these job interview questions. <laughs> where do you see yourself in 10 years? You know, what's the vision for Faith Forward? You know what the vision for Faith Forward Baptist is? Oh, it's not a, it's not a building. It's not a, a, a freestanding building. It's not, you know, just look, just never ask me again, hey, are we still in the strip mall? The answer is always yes until Jesus comes. Okay, just get a bigger strip mall, a bigger office space. But here's the thing. Not only that, but it's not about amassing a bunch of money because I don't want to have millions of dollars at my disposal. I don't need that. I need that like I need a hole in my head. What good is that going to do me? You know what I want? I just want to have enough money every month, not laid up and treasured up and put in a barn somewhere. No, I just want enough money coming in every month where I can provide for my family and where I get paid for the work that I do. That's all I want. I don't need to amass a bunch of wealth and I don't need to control millions of dollars of church assets. I don't need a big ego, a big pride thing of controlling some empire of buildings and ministries. The camp, uh, you know, our Tempe campus. When it starts being a campus, you know, <laughs> something went wrong. But anyway, I'm just saying the goal, my vision is, yes, to reach as many people as we can. But it's more about winning souls. It's about uh, knocking every single door in this greater Phoenix area five times, you know, and just giving everybody the gospel to where people are sick of hearing the gospel. You know, I, I heard a great uh, story this morning where my wife was telling me that, what was it, Shelly Russell was saying how she knocked somebody's door and they had, their Bible was just filled with invitations from our church over the years. Yeah. They had like seven invitations to our church. They'd been collecting them, you know, all the, all the different colors and styles, you know. And by the way, if you're listening out there, if you collect them all, there's a prize. If you come and bring, you know, one of each, one of each color, you know, you get a special prize. So it's like, it's like those little McDonald's Monopoly or something like, oh man, a yellow again, I need green. What's going on, you know? What's going on, faithful word? But the point is, you know, it's about winning souls. But you know what my desire is more than just this church growing? I, what, what do I want this? I mean, from a human perspective, what, why in the world would I want this church to grow? I don't need an ego trip. You know, if the church grows, it's just, it's just harder work for me to go find another building and to deal with more people. You know what I mean? It's just a headache. But you know what's even better, though, is if we can send people out to start churches all over America. My vision is to send 20 guys out to start churches all over America. Send 100 guys out to start churches all over America. Amen. Look, I walked over, I, we, we walked into Panera Bread in Dearborn a few months ago, and we walked in, and we'd never even, uh, we'd never even been there, and there were just 60 people ready and raring to go soul winning with us. Why? There are people all over America that want to go soul winning. 
that want to hear the Bible preach. But a lot of them, they don't really have a leader that they can get behind. They don't really have a local church that's really, you know, bringing them to their full potential. And of those 60 people or so that came soul winning, like half of them had never gone. You know, and, and, and if they had a church, though, in their area, they'd be out soul winning. Case in point, they came all the way out to our thing in, in Dearborn. So, you know, what we really need is we need to train other leaders, okay, so that it's diversified, where it's not just all about one person. We're all following Pastor Anderson. No, we need like a hundred leaders for people to look to. That way it's not about Pastor Anderson. It's about the word and it's about a whole bunch of different people that are all doing their own thing, independent, soul winning, fundamental Baptist. And then when one of them gets a little squirrely, it doesn't affect the rest because they're all independent. And so I pray to God that we would have more men in this church that would have the desire to someday go out and start a church and pastor, you know, and that, and that we could get them trained and that they would get serious and, and get, uh, you know, not play games with it, but to, to, to do the work, study their Bibles, read the Bible, memorize it, learn how to be a soul winner, learn how to be a leader, learn how to lead their family, and go out there and start a great church. That's a lot better than, hey, we ran X number in, you know, here in Tempe. We're the biggest fundamental church in Arizona. Who cares? I'd rather send out 100 people to go start churches all over America. And you know what? We should be sending out 100 people to go start churches. You know, there's no reason not to. Because honestly, as we grow, as we reach people, you know, I, I think that eventually, plus hopefully the guys that we send out, then they'll train other guys too. And, and we'll have the spiritual grandchildren of Faithful Word. So honestly, uh, I just wanted to give you that vision tonight of, of just getting, getting our view off of the physical, the temporal, and getting it on the spiritual where it belongs. Amen. Getting it on souls, getting it on people. And, and not having this idea of, well, we got to be financially responsible by, you know, putting aside money for a rainy day. Look, in your personal finances, you know, you run that how you want, okay? And yeah, obviously in our personal finances, we need a house, we need food, we need whatever. You know, but honestly, you know, there's dangers there too with the love of money. That's another sermon though. But I just want you to know that my philosophy for pastoring this church is to just, you know, do it by the seat of our pants, Spend all the money. Because you know what? What do we need to lay up a bunch of money for? Oh, well, what if something happens? There's money coming in every week. As long as we keep preaching and keep soul winning, the money's going to keep coming. And if the money stops coming, we'll figure something out. But I want to invest, I want to reinvest every penny into the work of God. And I'm not building any buildings ever. And if you say, well, I was hoping to stick around until you get out of that strip mall. Well, you know what? Just, you might as well leave now. Because we're never leaving. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you so much for your word, Lord, and we thank you for your son, Lord, and, and the, the blood of Jesus Christ that cleanses us from all sin. Help us to have spiritual things on the mind. Help our affections to be above, not on the things on the earth. Help us to realize that we are God's building. We are the building. Yeah, we have a real church building. It's people. Help us never to get sucked into this weird uh, emphasis on physical buildings and steeples and stained glass, Lord. Help us to keep it on souls and to be smart and wise and not to put any one person in control of just millions of dollars that's just sitting in a bank account some, somewhere that's just a temptation to every thief and robber out there. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.